And we are back. So with the success of Wrestling Lessons with Tiger Height, I kind of wanted to go into something that not a lot of people realize, and that is um, professional wrestling carny days. So we're going to start from the first incarnations of an actual wrestling um, whatever that relates to the carnival up to the actual version of the television. So your um, gorgeous Georges and stuff will not be here because we're not talking about that. A tradition of combining wrestling and showmanship originated in the 1830s France, where showmen presented wrestlers under names such as Edward the Steel Eater, Garav de Avignon, the Bone Wrecker, or Bonnet, the Ox of the Low Alps, and charged members of the public to knock them down for 500 francs. Um, I did not get the um, translation from francs to dollars, nor inflation, because I was too lazy. But this is the first kind of um, what actual else is new thing. With your laziness? Right? This is the first kind of incarnation of wrestling as a showmanship thing, and a lot of this circulates around strongmen. In 1848, French showman Jean Exploit, I think that's how you pronounce it, either I that or I butchered it, formed the first... Is, is Jean Expriot. Expriot. Okay, Expriot. I, I, I didn't have... Expriot. Ex okay, I we get it. Um, that so, sound, the, well, to me, that sounded more Russian. Right. I need to have some more wine here. Ex, ex, Expriot. That's how I'm going to do it. So Jean established the first modern wrestler circus trope and established a rule not to um, execute holds below the waist, a style he named flat hand wrestling. This new style soon spread to the rest of Europe, the, Ang the Anglo-Hungarian Empire. Austria. Austro-Hungarian Empire, Italy, Denmark, and Russia under the names of Greco-Roman wrestling. So Greco-Roman didn't exist until the mid-1800s, people. Classic wrestling, uh, or French wrestling, by the end of the 19th century, this modern Greco-Roman wrestling style went on to become the most fashionable sport in Europe. In 1898, the Frenchman Paul Pont, the Colossus, became the first professional wrestling's recognized world champion. Nice. So, professional wrestling in the sense of traveling performers paid to mass entertainment in staged matches began in post-Civil War period in the late 1860s and 1870s. During this time, wrestlers were often athletes with amateur wrestling experience who competed at um, who competed in traveling cir um, carnivals. Pardon, with um, carnies worked as their promoters and bookers. Um, grand circuses, including wrestling exhibitions, quickly enhanced them through colorful costumes and fictional biographies for entertainment disregarding the competitive nature. Wrestling exhibits during the late 19th century were also shown across the United States in um, countless, quote, athletic shows, or, quote, at shows, where experienced wrestlers offered open challenges to the audience. And these shows, often done for high-stakes gambling um, purposes, that the nature of the sport changed through, uh, through the competing interests of three groups of people. The Impressios, the Carnies, the Barnstormers, the Impressios, the Carnies, and the, the, and the Impresarios, which were the original French. Yep. The Carnies, which did it more for, like, the um, grandiose, and then the Barstormers, who were actually, like, the strong men. So, there was a, the strong men going against each other were the impressionado, the impressionados were the people who went against the, like, the fans. And then the Carnies were, like, the big grandiose, your um, very early WWF guys, let's put it that way. Like, the character. Yeah. Impressios 
were the managers who chose how the wrestlers could gain fame and interest along the fans, creating personas and improvising matches to make them more interesting. Carnies, who traveled and wrestled at these events, usually tricked to protest tricks. tricks to protect, protect their money, sorry, to protect their money and reputations during competitions, devising little known and often dangerous wrestling moves called hooks. Hooks are illegal in conventional amateur wrestling, but have high rates of success against removing rules from professional wrestling. Against even uh, the most... Oh, the most athletic and experienced of co competitors essentially removing the rules of professional wrestling. Sorry, I skipped a sentence. Let me bring this down here. In addition, some spectators capable of beating the carnies roam the, roam the country to compete in open challenges, settling side bets to make money. The Barnstormers competed and uh, competed as traveling wrestlers. Did often cooper who did and often cooperated with the Carnies to stage the matches, providing um and 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 gigantic profits. Let's put it that way. Enormous. Enormous. Is it enormous? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. I think the R kind of scram scrambled me there. I don't know why. Enormous profits for both sides in betting. Through the interest uh, in money-making among the three groups, wrestlers became a business-oriented entertainment venue, distinguishing itself further and further from its... Um, authentic amateur wrestling background. So as soon as they got into the circus, it became more about the showmanship, but that's a no-shit Sherlock moment. During this time, during the late 19th century and early 20th century, now we're starting to get into names here. Wrestling was dominated by Martin Farmer Burns and his pupil Frank Gotch. Burns was renowned as a competitive wrestler, who, despite, negative, despite never weighing more than 160 pounds during his wrestling career, fought over 6,000 wrestlers at a time when most competitor, uh, Austin, where most were competitive contests, and lost fewer than 10 times. He also gained a reputation for training some of the best wrestlers of that era, including Gotch, known as one of America's first sports superstars. Gotch, regarded as a peerless at the parks, first, you know, was the first to actually claim the world's undisputed heavyweight championship by beating all contenders in North America and Europe. But at this time, we get George Hackenschmidt. Who was the European wrestling yes. champion. So, and then he also went to the United States, into North America, um, between 1908 and 1911, seen by modern wrestling historians as two of the most significant matches in wrestling history. The popularity of wrestling be, um, during the 20, early 20th century was the highest in the Midwest, where um, ethnic European communities, mainly the German, Polish, Czech, Hungarian, Greek, and Slovakian, Scandinavian, Scandinavian um, in ancestry, continue to carry on fighting styles. So that's why you'll get a lot yep. of that's why you'll get a lot of shows in the Midwest is because that's where a lot of those communities are. Right, and now this is like early 1800s, right. so you're going to get a lot of those. Now, obviously, um, and then uh, this is where the first merchandise came out as well. So during the 1900s to the early 1920s, they launched trading cards for the competitors. So um, current George, original George Hackenschmidt and Frank Gotch cards right now are selling upwards of $30,000 in the United States. But these are like OGs, and I think they've only found like five um, collectively. Right that have been absolutely confirmed. Now, during this time, during the 1950s, 1920s, the popularity began to go into a tailspin because this is when Gotch and Hackenschmidt were kind of winding down too. 
So there was doubt among the high, the, uh, the yep. uh, competitiveness, the yep. legitimacy and competitiveness. So people, people were questioning this during that because Gotch's retirement was in 1913, and there were no new wrestling superstars, superstars like George, um, George Hackenschmidt, Frank Gotch, mm. that were capable of grabbing the audience's attention right. as at that time. So during that time and when the Gold Dust Trio come in. We have a new style because people were starting to see that. Right. So the three were Ed Lewis, Billy Sandow, and Toots Mott, obviously one of the principal owners of the Capital Wrestling Federation. Right. They joined their own promotions in the 1920s, modifying their in-ring style to um, attract fans. Mm -hmm. The three referred as the Gold Dust Trio due to their financial success. The promotion first time used time limit matches flashy new holds, and the for the first time ever, signature maneuvers. And actually, these three did wrestle. Toots Mont was the suplex. Billy Sandow's was the clothesline, and Eddie um, Strangler Lewis's was the headlock. So that's how early this also, they, um, they were the first ones, these three popularized tag team wrestling. Mm -hmm. Introducing new taxes such as distracting the referee to make matches more exciting. And also, they incorporated storyline aspects um, to really promote these between these guys' right. promotions. And a lot of what you are hearing now with um, kayfabe, like the, um, the general terms now that you hear now actually came from these three because they used Telegram. Right. And as they were trying to choreograph certain titles and matches and how to promote stories, they did not want a certain um, telecommunicator to get these communications right. and then translate it. So they used heel, babyface. Like they would use, for example, um, heel over babyface. Yep. Heel, heel, over ba heel over face or whatever that would yep. be for the, for the telegram. Yeah, because they had to go from the person to the telegram person, and then they would take it to there. So Ed Lewis had to go to the company, and then the company had to go to Billy Sandow right. to talk about it. So they didn't want them to spoil the finishes right. given who was working there. Right. Um, they gained great popularity nationwide in the best of years, roughly between 1920s and 1925, where they performed – in the eastern territory, acquiring fans in highly exposed big cities. Right. So this is like, you know, um, New York and... Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Boston. Yep. So they really worked there. The trio were dealt a severe blow by Stratovarius Zabisco when he beat the rookie Wayne Munn to win their world heavyweight champion. This was a um, shoot. Yeah, it was against well. the original booking. Yep, against the original booking. Munn, who had been recruited to wrestling and pushed to the high level of champion for the next few months in the Goldust Trio's new star and main attraction because he was very popular. Right. Zabisco was supposed to lose to Munn but refused to follow along, beating Munn so decisively and thoroughly that the referee awarded the title to him to prevent a riot. Right. So, because Zabisco was in his home city. So, Zabisco dropped the title to Joe um, Stetcher, a rival of Ed Lewis, making the situation worse for the trio because then, because um, Joe Stetcher was a, not a relative unknown, but he was like a mega heel. Right. Like, he was hated. So, and then from Stetcher along with an able booker was... Um, was of, was afraid of losing his championship, refusing to wrestle many of the contenders as a result. This made it impossible for the trio to get this championship back. They responded by calling the Munzabisco match illegitimate and reinstating Mun as champion, but quickly had him drop it to Lewis and left two champions, Ed Lewis and Joe Stetcher, who were regarded as dominant wrestlers in their period, Stetcher and Lewis agreed to a unification match 
years later in 1928 when Stetcher gave in and lost to the match to Lewis. By this time, the Zabisco double cross had already caused irreparable damage. Um, distracting from the trio, detracting, sorry, detracting from the trio's dominance over the wrestling industry. In addition, the build-up to Munn, following by such a humiliating loss, at, um, did devalue, devalue, there we go, devalue his, devalued, devalued his title and credibility as a major wrestling superstar permanently. So, at this time, the television came along, and then no, there, television wasn't along until the fifties. Yeah, but this this kind of split apart because then um, Tutmont had a huge fight with Billy Sandow, who really wanted to keep that might Ed be Lewis something. That might be something for another time because right. here is like the TV that come out in nineteen twenty eight. Right. You have to wait until the 50s. Right. You but, but, but this is how this separated here. Yes, but, was, was but this talk about it at a later point. Well, I mean, okay, this is still kind of there, but yes. Um, this is kind of where wrestling started um, as a part of the showmanship portion of it. Um, the whole thing where Statuary Zabisco, they actually gave um, Larry Zabisco that last name because of that reason. Because there was so much hate with Zabisco... When he betrayed San Martino, boom, you have instant heat because of that last name. So that is Carney Day Wrestling in a, a nutshell nonetheless. I apologize. Every, everything that happened up to 1928. Everything that happened in 19, up to 1928 is kind of there. There was a lot... There was a lot going on Well, here, when we come back from our break, we are going to start on the CMLL 87th anniversary show, and we'll be right back. Yes.